final talk. It has been such an incredible three days. And I know some of you have not only been here today, but the last couple of sessions as well. So it's brilliant to have you all with us and packing out for our final guest. And I'm pretty excited to get him up here in just a moment. I think the way we're talking about the sport, especially within the realms of Rule Air magazine, has changed so, so much. The agenda's changing, it's broadening, it's exciting. And to talk a little bit before we get our guest up here is editor Ed Pickering. Put your hands together, give him a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. It's been a fantastic three days. I'm an empty, hollowed out shell of a man, and my job is only to walk around and smile at people. I want to say thank you to the diligent and hardworking crew who have actually put together the whole event, to all our hosts, to the hardworking crew on this side, and to our guest stars. Um, so, Rouleau magazine, we aim to cover cycling culture in all its glory. Um, we know that cycling is the greatest sport in the world. And somebody out there on the floor mentioned to me that you just get great people at events like this because people who love cycling, we know we're all great people, and we've all been talking to them. It's been a real kind of exciting exchange of ideas. Um, we've enjoyed all the, all the bikes we've been able to see. Um, Rouleau's point is to cover, to cover this and encapsulate it and um, you know, ex make, ex express all our shared passion for the sport. And Rouleau Live is the kind of real world manifestation of that. So thank you all for coming. Uh, just one last thing, we're going to lock the doors um, nobody leaves without buying a subscription to Rouleau Magazine. We've got a, <laughs> got a special offer of four magazines for £20, which is frankly giving its way. And there are QR codes all over the walls. Um, once you've bought your subscription, you may leave and get back to your normal lives, but otherwise, please support, <laughs> support the magazine, support the show, and support cycling. And thank you all for coming. But I think you're not here to listen to me. I think we're here to see um, Lachlan Morton. Let's get them up here, put your hands together for Lachlan Morton. <laughs> hello, hello, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. <laughs> so how long have you been in London? Any sightseeing yet? <laughs> uh, I went to the Tower of London a few days ago. Um, nice. But outside of that, no, not really. I've just been uh, flat out running about, catching the train a lot. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, it's brilliant that everyone made it here with the train drama. Very happy about that. Yeah. Now, every sort of athlete we've had up on the stage so far, I'm talking about the off-season, what people are doing in their off-season, a chance to reflect. But where you're at in your career now, does it work like that anymore? Do you have this on-season, off-season? Um, typically, the last few years, like I felt like I haven't really needed it. Um, I've been doing so many different disciplines that it's not like I'm... Um, like blown out on, on racing or training. Um, and I've just basically just continued to ride through. This year, I definitely feel like I need a rest. Um, so I've had a couple of weeks off. Um, but I think in those two weeks, I've spent like 24 hours at home. <laughs> um, like between a trip here and then last weekend, I was in uh, Poland. And then I finished up my season in the US. Um, so yeah, it's been time off, but like probably more exhausting than if I could just go ride my bike. <laughs> <laughs> now this is going to sound very much like Ed and I have been Googling like most asked interview questions <laughs> all time or something. But I want to start with this. How would you describe yourself as a bike rider? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think uh, I started off as very much a traditional road cyclist, like young kid who dreamed of doing the Tour de France. Um, and then when I got to a position where that was like a possibility, um, I basically just went the other direction and have tried to explore and experience as many things as I can um, through the bike. Some of that's racing, um, some of it isn't. Uh, but yeah, I think in in general, I just, yeah, I am a bike rider, <laughs> like at heart, at first and foremost. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I find it hard to describe myself, I guess, any more than that. It's quite uh, a good thing, though, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, could I just ask, you, were you, you, uh, did you always feel like 
a road cyclist, an adventure cyclist in a road cyclist body, this was always waiting to come out, or did you have to go through those years of being a roadie in order to end up where you are? Yeah, no, I definitely had to go through all the experiences I've had to get to where I was at. Um, like, as a... I got into cycling when I was eight years old. Um, there was, like, a strong local club, and my brother was doing it, and we were good at it. Um, so, like, you... I just pursued that, and I didn't know... At that point, there was other disciplines. There was, like, track cycling and, and road cycling, and I was, like, very... Um, driven and like obsessive about about achieving all the things I wanted to in cycling um, and didn't really see the bike outside of something I could use to like race or, or beat people um, and then through the process of like basically exhausting that avenue of cycling for myself um, I, like I was burnt out on it and then I was kind of left with, like, this one ability, um, which was to ride a bike. Uh, but there was, like, the, the one way I knew to do it, um, I wasn't getting enjoyment out of anymore. And then that's when I started to just basically go on long bike rides, um, more so than anything, just to try and, like, work out my own direction in life. Um, and then through that process discovered all the other things I could be doing on my bike, and that led to, to bigger adventures and, and different, I guess, challenges for myself um, in that like, exploration of what, what's that like, whole experience I can have. Um, and you still, you still have a job as a, as a world tour cyclist. <laughs> yeah. um, but does that, does that period of, what's your perspective on that period of road racing? Um, it's interesting, like I'm, I'm proud of everything I achieved as, as a, I guess, elite level cyclist. Um, there's also parts of it that are hard to reflect on because um, I definitely had like a lot of difficult moments, like trying to mold myself into an elite level athlete when I think um, that goes against now, if I'm honest with myself, like what my personality is. Um, so I have like a lot of, uh, moments that I'm, I'm really proud of and then a lot of moments that like I need to remind myself of for sure but um, are tough to, to relive. And are you on call for the World Tour team? Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Um, I have a two year World Tour contract. Uh, I'm not sure how much road racing I'll be doing um, but in theory, yes. Um, if they need my services or not, that's probably the bigger question. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to hop back to the beginning for a moment, because I know we have a lot of young people, which is lovely, in the audience today. And they're probably wondering, how did you get towards your first professional road contract? How was that pathway possible for you, and where did it all start? Um, yeah, so I, I started racing road bikes when I was eight, basically following my brother's, like, footsteps in a way. Like, he was the coolest guy I knew, because he's your older brother, so, like, of you course. wanted to do the same thing. <laughs> um, and then... We were lucky, like, the town I grew up in um, had a really strong cycling club, um, which was, like, an abnormality, I guess, for, like, smaller Australian towns. Um, and the coach and the guy who ran that club uh, had ridden in the Olympics uh, in Moscow, and he kind of took my brother and I under his wing, and from there, like, I was like, oh, yeah, racing's cool, like, I'm, I'm good at it, so I'm going to, like, keep going to the races on the weekend, but it wasn't more than that. And then we went on a, a family holiday to see the tour. Well, we saw the tour as part of our uh, holiday, and then I was like, oh, wow, this is a real thing, um, because, like, there weren't, like, professional cyclists in Australia that I knew at that time. Um, and from there, like, I don't know, it was just this weird thing that clicked for me. I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And um, went about, like, trying to win every race I could. So it was like, you know, winning a state title and then a national title and then going and doing, like, uh, international races um, in quite a, like, 
like I was crazy. <laughs> you know, I would wake up at like 4.30 every morning and do three hours training before school and then like ride home from school and that was, if, if anyone asked me what I was going to be when I was older, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a professional cyclist. Um, not knowing what that really meant, but that is just like this goal. Uh, and then kind of had a, a one a US national title, weirdly, when I was a, a junior, and Jonathan Borders was there, and then that led to an opportunity to race on their development team, and it was very like, um, from that point, it was like a very normal trajectory, mm. and I could see like, I think I signed like a two or three year contract with the development team that then led into a world tour contract and it was like a very normal development like funnel, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think I was 20 when I joined the world tour. And then that's when like, I was kind of confronted with the reality of like what my dream had been and it wasn't what I thought it would be, I guess. It's really interesting in terms of how you were spotted and which part of the world, because something we've spoken about actually over the last couple of days is how things like Zwift Academy are now giving a pathway to people from your part of the world, because you say about going over to the Tour de France, coming over to Europe, that's a mightily long journey yeah. to fly from Australia, and not everybody has the capacity to go and live in Europe. It's totally. Yeah, I think um, I was very lucky. I had like super supportive parents uh, who were willing to like help us realize like a dream um, and as you said like not everyone has that and I think it's an exciting time now uh, because of those things you know like if you have the ability um, now there's so many avenues to show that and so many ways you can get spotted or, or prove yourself I guess um, even if it's like you said on Swift or um, in a gravel event or, you know, a traditional road racing sense, I think it's cool to see that. Yeah, different avenues. In yeah. Interesting thing is there's always been a, tr you know, the tradition always was that Australian riders kind of came around the world, followed that path, and it was everything or nothing. Yeah. And uh, do, you, do you feel like you're maybe the last of that tradition and you've, you've been the one to maybe even break, break the mold of, of the way it's done? Um, I think, like, that was starting to shift. Uh, I mean, there, there's definitely riders from my generation who did it the old school hard way and basically packed up and moved to Belgium and then just raced until they got noticed. Um, I was lucky in the sense that I kind of got to skip that process because I won the right race at the right time and then had an opportunity. Um, but I think it's, it's always going to be difficult when it's a Euro Eurocentric sport uh, it doesn't matter, you know, now it's like, okay, there's different avenues to get noticed, but at the end you're still uprooting your life and moving halfway across the world. Um, and you can FaceTime all you like, it's not the same thing. Um, there's, there's cultural differences. Uh, and there's just like less of a support network. Yeah. Um, so I think, like, yes, it's, it's, it's different than it was 20, 30 years ago. Like, okay, those people were really making a huge life decision. But I still think it's a, it's a big deal to uproot your life even now um, as a, a young, ambitious rider and to move your life to Europe. That's still a significant undertaking for sure. It was something that like I underestimated and is probably what ultimately led me to like hate cycling <laughs> when I was 21 years old because I was like, oh, you know, I can still talk to my family and I can do all these things, but the reality was, like, I was half a world away from all my best friends, you know, um, which isn't to be underestimated. And, and this will bring us on to what we're actually meant to be talking about, <laughs> which is not road cycling. Um, was there a single inflection point where you kind of diverted and went on this course, or was it just an accumulation of pressures and stresses? It was definitely uh, an accumulation of things. There was... Uh, a trip I did with my brother when we rode to the middle of Australia. Um, that was a very much like a, a an awakening in a way of of that was a deflection point when I really realised all the other things I could do on my bike and that I could have these amazing experiences and 
like personal growth while meeting a bunch of new people um, and experiencing landscapes that like were new to me. And that was like a two week trip. Um, but after that, there was a real, I guess like light bulb moment. And I went back to race in the world tour and had like a very difficult time with it then um, because knowing that all these other possibilities were out there and I was like, discovering the very small slither of what I could be doing. Mm -hmm. And then over the process of the next four years, um, I started to do more trips like that, and I went back to the US and raced on a, a smaller team, so I had more time to do things like that. Um, ultimately, I went back to the World Tour with Dimension Data, and I couldn't do as much of, of the, I guess, other stuff outside of road cycling as I would like to. And then the opportunity with EF came up um, through, through Rafa. And I was like, okay, I can finally combine these things in one and really like push this and, and see how far we can go with it. So that was, it, yeah, it was like a, a number of things. Um, but I think ultimately to push it to the level we have now, it took like backing from sponsors um, and, and people to enable me to have that opportunity. And I want to pick up on that opportunity and, and how well that's gelled with the vision of yourself and the team, EF. When you signed with them, was it always in mind? Were those conversations happening that you might transcend the traditional Grand Tour path, for example? Yeah, that was um, like, it was basically the partnership with Rafa and EF and I had a relationship with Rafa and they had this idea of um, splitting the calendar and, and doing a bunch of new exciting races and they envisioned me like taking that on. Um, so I was just kind of lumped in with that deal <laughs> and um, so my role like right away was to take on those um, alternate events is what we like tagged it but uh, yeah, so that was like the initial um, step towards that. But I loved it. Like it wasn't, it was something I wanted to be doing anyway. So I was like, this is the dream. Yeah. And uh, EF were really supportive of it, uh, like right off the bat, but it was still unproven, I guess. So it was up to like myself as a writer and then uh, also the crew at Rafa creating all the films. Um, it, was, it was kind of like, it ended up being a very small crew of us, but it was on us to like prove this concept a little yeah. bit, um, which, yeah, we managed to do. And uh, it's, it's grown out of that. Yeah, and I guess that's the interesting point, is actually proving that it can and does work, because I imagine you had a lot of people trying to put it in a box. Well, what is it? What does this season look like? How are you going to do this? Because no other team, I think it's fair to say, has embraced that hybrid of opportunity. Yeah, and I think, I mean, cycling is very traditional, and I think the traditional model of a team is like selling spots on a jersey and kind of tricking people into thinking that that's enough. Um, and at the end of the day, like, our job as cyclists, like, yes, it's, it's to ride fast, but if you look at it from, like, a commercial point of view, it's to give your sponsors, like, return on their investment in what they're doing. Um, and by me going and doing these other things, the sponsors were getting a, lo a lot of that, um, even though it wasn't, I guess, in a traditional path. And, I mean, that was kind of all happening separate. To, I was just like, oh, I want to go do these cool races. Um, but that's what ultimately made it work for the team and enabled them to, like, uh, I guess, leverage an athlete in a way that wasn't just, like, getting a result um, or TV time or, you know. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think we would have been sat here having these conversations about ultra cycling, about gravel, and we've had so many over the last couple of days, haven't we, Ed? It's yeah. changing the That's game true. a lot. You are changing the game it's, a lot. It's changed everything, really. And it, it's, you know, it's, in a way, Lachlan's been kind of le leading this, but the, the whole sport is following in your, in your wake. Mm. You know, Rulo used to be a road, a road racing magazine. 
and uh, we're no longer a road racing magazine. We cover road racing still, and it's an important, very important part of our, our DNA. But we, you know, we, we cover cycling culture, we cover adventure riding, we, we, we cover you know, gravel racing, we cover you know, anything we can relate to life on two wheels and the passion that you know, is in people to, to cycle. Um, that's, that's good for us. And it's, it's, you know, we've, we've followed in, in your wake on that. And it's, it's kind of, so if you could tell us where, where it's going in the next few years, that'd be very useful. <laughs> <laughs> useful Play that one out for us. But and initially, was, you know, were you pushing against an open door with um, the EF management or did they take persuading? Did they immediately see what the potential uh, was? No, I mean, I think they were really good. Like they understood the, the concept really, but it was a matter of like executing that, that concept. Um, initially, I like felt the pressure to like keep the the door open in, in road racing in case it didn't work out and also prove that I'm like, I can do these races and still perform on the road um, and like managed to do that pretty well in that first year. Um, but no, there was never like any, like, com I think that's the beauty of being in a, a pretty forward thinking team. Um, I mean, there's always like, I would turn up at races and I don't think like the sports directors took me as seriously, but that was more just like, I mean, I could deal with that. Like, that's that, fine. Was that Andres Clear or just? <laughs> no, not Andres. Just, I mean, there's um, a lot of, I guess, the performance element of cycling is still very traditional and, and specified. So, like, if I turned up from a Three day like gravel ultra to do the Giro, they'd be like, What's this guy gonna do? <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> and like, understandably, but uh, that's not really pushback, that was just like initial growth, I guess. Um, and I mean, now you, you see more and more, like, even in the elite level, there's a bunch of uh, cyclists who can do a bunch of disciplines and combine them all really successfully. So that concept is kind of proven. And can you actually break down or, or even un understand you know, why this seems, why what you're doing seems to have had such an effect and touched enough, um, so many people? Yeah, I think uh, I was lucky in that like, there's nothing I've done that is like breaking new ground. Um, I think like traditionally men's road cycling s receives like a really disproportionate amount of the coverage within cycling on the whole. So as like a, a male road cyclist switching, there was already a bigger spotlight. And then I was just doing events that already existed, but trying to combine them all into a single calendar. Um, so then we were kind of linking different facets within cycling that are all interesting and in trying to combine them. Um, so I think m maybe people connected with the idea that like, you know, you can go and, and combine a bunch of things and, and you don't really need to like adhere to a certain path in cycling and you could kind of take it and make it what you wanted. Um, that was the, the goal of it and that's what I hope people got out of it. Um, but yeah, I think I was just fortunate I was in a position where there were people already looking at me and it was a matter of just using that to like, I guess, build the sport in different ways. Mm. We had the guys up from Badlands on stage with me yesterday and of course you won the inaugural edition. Um, how did that come about? Did you know about the event? Of course it was the first year, it was kicking off. How, how did you discover those guys and get involved? Um, well that was 2020, which like was a weird year for racing in general and there wasn't a lot on. And earlier that year, I'd been stuck back in the States and had like gone to do the Coca Pelli Trail and done like the Everest thing thing. And I was just in a mode where I was just looking for things to go and do. Yeah. And I'd finally got back to Europe and I was like, oh, there's this cool ultra on that I could just go down and do. Um, and that was about all the thought that went into it. I think that was like <laughs> 10 days before and then I went down there and did it. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, an appealing race in that there's so many unique like um, landscapes you go through and you know you get high alpine and desert and 
it's like doable in a couple of days. So I was like, yeah, I'll go do that. <laughs> um, that was how that came about. I wasn't um, expecting... I mean, I wasn't expecting anything out of it apart from just like a, an experience, you know? Like, it's, it's now, I guess, grown into like one of the bigger like ultra races. Um, but yeah, I, it was just a race that was on. I like how you're just referring to doing it in a couple of days when we had the discussion about it being up to six days for yeah, the right. cutoff. But you just do it in a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> what was the margin to the next rider? Uh, uh, Hayden, my mate, was uh, second. He'd never done an ultra. So we were wow. riding together in Girona. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do it. And he was like, yeah, all right, I'll go do it. And like, he borrowed a gravel bike. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was 12 hours or something like that. Um, but Close then. he, like, I had a very smooth, uneventful ride. I think if he went and relived Hayden's experience at that race, um, that'd be a much more interesting talk. <laughs> yeah, because I can imagine it's unpredictable, these events, this ultra cycling world. I mean, you can't presumably predict how some of the elements are going to affect you. Yeah, for me, that's like the appeal of the really long stuff and uh, especially like the multi-surface like in ultras I guess um, I think it's like the discipline where your physical ability counts the least and then it, it requires like experience and then also like mentally an ability to adapt to like a bunch of different situations so I don't think you could ever get bored doing them because the challenge always changes you know um, sometimes it's it's a physical thing, sometimes mentally you're in a bad spot, uh, sometimes it's mechanical, there's, there's just so many things that can basically go wrong and you're just constantly problem solving. Yeah, and that's what you love about it, that just such a different element to what yeah, you have in you, the peloton where it's like plan, plan, plan. Exactly, and you never know what's going to happen. You know, you line up with this idea of what a dream ride looks like and then inevitably within the first six hours something's gone sideways and from there you feel like you're just kind of like stumbling through this thing like kind of putting out fires um, and that's what makes it rewarding when you finally pull things together and, and manage to like overcome that that's that's the appeal and it's and great do, storytelling for us <laughs> do you still have like the competitive urge to win these events or is the actual experience of riding much more of a, a no, anytime I'm like pinning a number on and it's a race, I'm still like um, very competitive. And sometimes I wish that was something I could switch off more, but I just like, I'm kind of at e Well, I just accepted the fact now that like that's just a part of who I am. Um, and that's probably what enabled me to become a competitive cyclist in the beginning. And now I, I, I embrace that as much as I can, and racing is still that outlet, um, but I kind of leave it in the races now, like, um, I try and remove, like, my ego from the rest of the, the riding that I do, and I enjoy it more for that. Yeah. Can you tell us, you know, the Alt Tour wasn't a race, um, can you tell us a bit more about the experience and your memories and mm -hmm. perspective on on that event. And, and actually, for anyone sat here not knowing what the Alt Tour was, can you tell us exactly <laughs> what was that? Uh, yeah, so the idea was to ride the Tour de France route um, unsupported and start at the same time and try and beat the peloton to uh, back to Paris. And, and I would ride the transfers as well, so just like one big long ride, um, which is like, it's a pretty big... <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty that big undertaking, <laughs> um, but like, it, and it wasn't my idea. Uh, the idea actually came from like JV and Philip Holt, um, and they put it to me, and I was straight away like, "Yes, that's something I wanted to." And it was a wild experience. Um, it's like a really fond memory for me, and I actually. Believe it or not, had like quite a bit of fun doing it. Um, it was like inevitably same thing. There were a bunch of challenges that came up. Um, the biggest one being like my my knee, I guess, and then I rode in the sandals, which 
If you were familiar with it, there were a lot of feet photos. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There was it was big days. Normally, like I guess 12 hours of riding each day, and then um, staying in different campgrounds, and then you know organizing my food and all that kind of thing. Um, but as difficult as like the physical element was, um, I take so much enjoyment out of doing that stuff that it, it definitely, like I remember it, everything positive more so than I remember the difficult moments of it. Now, for anyone that was listening to that and picked up on sandals, that, that is exactly what you just said, that you were riding those distances in open-toed sandals. How did that happen because presumably you started off did you start off in cleats i did yeah um i started just yeah regular road shoes and then on the first day it was a new bike and i hadn't ridden it and things weren't set up properly and instead of just like fixing it i just like pull, pulled this massive first day and just woke up and my knee was like ruined um because I had something, of the position, yeah. yeah, I had something like not quite right, uh, and then, like, at that point, the damage was done, and once I'd fixed the positional stuff, it didn't help because the there was already inflammation in there, and then you're trying to still ride like 300 kilometers <laughs> on a weighted bike, and just, it was just like getting worse. This was relatively early on in the event as well. You still had several thousand kilometers to ride. Yeah, yeah, that was the first day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, yeah, I was like trying to nurse it and just like trying everything I could to fix it, but nothing would work. And then uh, when I stopped at one of the campgrounds, I like was riding with my uh, foot on top of the shoe, just like out, mm -hmm. and that was like, I think I was going to the supermarket, and I was like, oh, that feels a bit better. Um, and so that was when, in my head, I was turning, I was like, I need flat pedals, like, if I can get in flat pedals, I'll be fine. And found a bike, got some f flat pedals, and then the shoes I had were sandals. Um, they were like, they were the, yeah knock off Birkenstocks um, and then it just they just worked really well and it's funny because like everyone it was the first thing they would say is like oh how are you doing that in sandals but in my head I was like these are so much better than where I was at like two days ago with the knee so I was like happy once I got in those things um, and then it was like I had to modify them quite a bit um, because I was getting like blisters <laughs> and so in the end, like, I was like tying a tube around and like, they, it got pretty funny <laughs> from the outside, but there was a method in my head. Um, but yeah, no, it, it like, that's a very, that was a very small part of the challenge, but I think it was a very visual one because like you're drawn to the fact that like you're in sandals, but after like one day, I, I basically forgot I was wearing them. It's amazing. And I want to break down that element of unsupported and exactly what that looks like to anyone who hasn't done these types of events. Presumably, you can't go, OK, my cleat position's a bit off, get me loads of kit flown in. You know, that's not how it works. Uh, no, so, the, yeah, you basically ride under your own support. And so problems like that are just kind of, like, on yourself to fix. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, I guess in a simple form, like unsupported, it's like you're, you've got to find your food and like place to sleep and then all the riding you do is, is under your own power. Um, that it's like, it's a funny term. I mean, I had a film crew following me, so by a lot of standards, people would say that's not self-supported. Um, but yeah, they, they, <laughs> that's just... That. Well, I was actually going to ask about that because, again, they're there, but they're not there, right? You, yeah. you can't lean on them in any aspect. So it's almost, yeah, like you're dangling a carrot that you can't utilize. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, I think Sam, Sam and Yev and Kim, like, they are here and they shot it. Um, and we work together enough, like, throughout the years of making all the EF films. Um, that 
they kind of know the way I go about it, and they know like they if they offer help, it's gonna frustrate me more. So like they basically just watch no matter what, and I'm like, you can film whatever you want, just like don't get in my way and like just let me do my thing. Don't um, mention the sandals. I like them. <laughs> yeah, and like at the same time, I'm sure they've waited like a hundred times for six hours for me to come through, and then like you know. I'd ride too fast or when they'd be like, oh, damn it, you know, I wish you'd just stop. But like, then that's just like, that's the way it works. Um, and I've done rides like with a film crew and without a film crew. And it, in my opinion, it doesn't make any difference. But um, yeah, that's just how the rules work. And how did it feel to ride into Paris? It was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the last stint I did to Paris was like pretty long. So I'd been riding over 24 hours, I think. Um, but it was great. Like, I came into Paris. I had a really rough stint just before I got to Paris and came through this big rainstorm. And then I was like, oh, am I going to make it? And then rain stopped and this, like, epic crew of people came out. And we, like, basically took over the streets and just uh, smashed around Paris, Paris, like, at night. It was really cool. Uh, but the laps... The laps were hard. Because of the traffic. <laughs> well, it was in the middle of the night, so there wasn't much traffic, but like, even I, I imagine like if you're doing the race, like you kind of get to Paris, then you're like, oh wait, now I have to do these laps as well. But when you're doing them as slow as I was, like that's a lot of riding. Like yeah. just up and down the Champs-Élysées, it's like 60 Ks or something, like <laughs> you're just out there. Um, but no, it was, it was really nice. Like it was one of the few uh, experiences I've had on a bike where I was already, I was like content with the effort I had and I had so much time to reflect, especially on that final push, like on the ride I'd had and I was very like, yeah, just content with it and I was like, I've had, I've got the exact experience I wanted to have out of this and so we finished and I didn't feel like we needed to go and like celebrate and you know, have a party because I was just kind of like the the reward came in the ride um, itself, which is like it's rare to to have that feeling. So it was, it, yeah, it was special. Best and worst places you slept. <laughs> uh, the best one there was one campsite in the in the Pyrenees, and I can't even remember the name of the town right now, but. Um, it was like a really quiet campsite, but there was like a really well stocked shop <laughs> like there. So I thought I was going to be like slim on rations, but there was like they had everything you needed. The grass was really soft and there was like nice showers. Um, it was just like a dream. And then the worst one, one night I camped like next to, I think it was just outside of. Leon or somewhere, but they, they had like a big, uh, well actually not a big, there was like a stadium next to it, like oh, I wonder what that is, and then at like 11pm it started to like fill up and fill up, and then <laughs> there was like a bullfight <laughs> going on in there until like, like I think the bullfighting went on until maybe 2 in the morning, and then there was just a big party outside, but like the sounds coming from inside there were just horrible. Like I was almost just going to get up and be like, all right, I'm just going to leave now. Um, that, yeah, that was the worst spot for sure. You're probably finding yourself going, yeah, going to sleep in one situation and waking, oh, hi, <laughs> yeah. hello. Yeah. <laughs> it's just incredible, isn't it? It, it is. There's another, another ride you've been doing recently. You've been working with Mark Padun, yep. your teammate on EF Education, who he's a post who's... Um, Ukrainian. So can you talk to us, explain to us a little bit about what you've been doing with him? Uh, yeah, I, I did a ride earlier this year um, after the war in Ukraine broke out. A few weeks after that, um, I was just like, what can I do to contribute like whatever I can? Um, and the only thing I can do is ride bikes. <laughs> I'm very aware of that. Uh, so I was like, I'll just plan a really big ride to the border of the Ukraine. Um, and when the, the war broke out, I was actually on a race with Mark, um, which like definitely brought it closer to home. Um, so yeah, I did like a, a thousand K single push to the border to, to raise some money for people who were 
fleeing the country and displaced. Um, and in the process of that, uh, I met a group of young Ukrainian cyclists who were staying in Poland um, that had to leave uh, and leave their families behind. And they were basically living at the Polish uh, Federation. And I went and met them and rode with them and then we kind of left and between us we were like, oh, I think we can get these kids outfitted with bikes and like try and just give them something to, you know, have some normalcy in their life. Uh, and yeah, through Cannondale and uh, Physique gave some shoes, um, we were able to get them like outfitted and finally, this, just this last weekend, Mark and I got to go back and, and give them these bikes, um, which was special, you know. Uh, but it also just like drove home that reality of like, you know, they're still very much living that. Um, and it is like a, a tough situation for, for everyone in that mm. part of the world. Yeah, yeah. I'm aware that we're almost out of time and that's actually along those lines is something else I just wanted to, to quickly get in before we close. And we've got the Buffalo bike up here and the main driving force be behind the Alt Tour was for World Bicycle Relief and supplying many, many bikes to children. Can you just briefly tell us about how much you raised, why it was important to you, and actually delivering the bikes yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, it's been like a real privilege to be able to work with World Bicycle Relief. Um, they supply these Buffalo bikes um, all over Africa, also in Colombia. Um, and they're doing, you know, real life-changing work. Um, like, for me, bikes have changed my life and I come from a place of like absolute privilege and have every opportunity. Um, so for someone to receive a bike who doesn't have those opportunities, um, you know, it's even more significant. And we partnered with them to, to raise some money. And uh, earlier this year, I was able to go to Colombia to where most of those funds went and be part of some of those bike handouts and also see like people who had received those bikes and, and see the, the real world impact that has. And it's like, it's very humbling, you know? And um, I feel lucky to have played like a small role in that. And I certainly feel like I've gotten just as much out of it um, as everyone else. So um, it's, a, it's a really cool organization and I really hope that I can, you know, continue to work and, and support with that, support that, that group. What a wonderful note to end on. We're out of time. Okay, Please great. put your hands together for Lachlan Morton. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Absolute pleasure.